Chapter Three of Mary, Our Little Norwegian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mary, Our Little Norwegian Cousin by Mary Hazelton Blanchard Wade. The Christening. Oh, mother, I have something to tell you. I have just been down to the village, and I heard there that neighbor Han's wife has a new baby. It is a boy. Everyone says he is a fine little fellow, said Mary one beautiful afternoon. Dear me, dear me, that is fine news, truly, said her mother. I must make her a dish of my best portage and take it to her in the morning. Did everybody remember you when I was born, mother? Yes, dear. The people of the village seemed to vie with each other in preparing a dish of flot de grode. It tasted so good. It was hard to tell whose was the best. You must learn how to make this cream portage now. Mary, you are quite old enough. You will never be thought a good housekeeper if you cannot make smooth flot de grode. The baby is to be christened next week. Everybody will be there, of course, mother. The farm was only half a mile from a little fishing village on the shore of a deep bay. Such a long, narrow bay is called a fjord. There are many fjords in Norway. There were only about a dozen cottages in the village, but in their midst was a tiny little church and a small building used as a schoolhouse. But the school was not kept there all year round. Half the time the master taught in this place, and the rest of the year he spent in another little village a few miles up the coast. Neither of them was large enough to pay a teacher for the whole year round. The children, however, were glad to work hard while he was among them. They loved their teacher and their school, and they learned quickly. Everyone in the place was busy now, getting ready for the christening. At last the great day, as bright and sunny a one as could be wished. All the work on the farm was stopped, and everyone in the family was dressed in his best. Mary had a fresh white linen kerchief tied under her chin, and also a finely starched apron. Her plump little arms were bare. Her stomacher was worked with bright beads on a scarlet cloth. She had embroidered it all herself, and she could not help being proud of it. But perhaps you do not know what a stomacher is. It is a piece of cloth worn as an ornament on the waist over the stomach. Mary's mother wore one also but hers was sparkling with silver trimmings that belonged to her great-grandmother. How fine the father looked in his short coat and knee breeches. He wore a bright red vest over which hung his long, light beard. But Mary's mother was the prettiest of all. Her muslin apron was trimmed with three rows of lovely open work. Her scarlet waist was finished with bands of black velvet. The beautiful stomacher was in front of that. She had loose white linen sleeves and such an odd cap. You never saw one like it, I'm sure. It was made of crimped white muslin with a wide rim over the forehead with a narrow band beneath that hid her hair. The corners fell down behind nearly to the waist. Her silver ornaments must also be mentioned. They were really beautiful and were hundreds of years old. Ole looked fine too, in a suit much like his father's in a little round cap, fitting tightly to his head. You would scarcely have known the family in their holiday dress. They stepped off gaily and soon reached the village. They arrived at church just as the christening party had reached it. Do look at the dear baby, Ole, said Mary. Isn't he lovely? The nurse was carrying him. He was so swaddled in his fine clothes that you would have almost thought he was an Indian papoose. Only his face could be seen. The swaddling bands were of many colors, red, green, and white. And there was a large white satin bow, of course. Every Norse baby wears such a bow to its christening. And now the flocks of people followed the minister to the little church. They passed up to the front and gathered round the altar. The baby behaves finely, doesn't he? whispered Ole. I am really proud of him because he is to have the same name as myself. Did you hear the minister say Ole, Mary? Yes, but look now, the baby's father and mother and his godparents are all going up behind the altar. What is that for? They are laying presents there for the minister. Of course they want to thank him for the christening. I declare, Mary, our baby was christened only last year, but you have forgotten what people do at such times. 
I was so excited then, Ole, I don't believe I noticed it. But come, everybody is going out of the church. Now we shall have the best time, for you know we are invited to the party. The building was soon empty, and all the people started gaily for the home of the new baby. The minister went with them, of course. He looked very dignified in his long black gown, with the great white ruff about his neck. He loved his people, and took part in their merry-makings. Ole and Mary were very fond of him. They ran to his side as soon as they got outdoors. Ole took one hand and Mary the other. It was only a few steps to the little home of the fisherman. Everything had been made ready for company. The table was spread with the good things that the Norse people loved best. In the center of the table stood an old silver bowl from which everyone must drink to the health of the new baby. This bowl was the most precious thing in the simple home. It had not been used before since the parents of the baby came here and held their wedding feast. There is much eating and frequent handshaking. It seemed as though the company could only show how loving they felt toward one another by the hearty shakes which they gave so often. When everyone had eaten so much that he could hold no more with comfort, the table was quickly cleared and a young man brought out a fiddle from the corner of the room. Now for some of our Norse songs, cried one of the company. Good, good, cried all, and soon the room was filled with lively music. The new baby behaved very well and went to sleep in the midst of it. But Mary's baby brother, who had come to the party with the rest of the family, was having too good of a time to shut his eyes for a moment. It was not until the dancing began that his little head commenced to a nod and his eyes could keep open no longer. The older folk and the children sat against the wall and talked together while the younger people waltzed around the room. Gustav, we want you to see Frigga in the sprig dance, said one of the party after a while. Oh yes, Gustav, you can both do it so well, cried another. We must see it before we go home. Gustav stepped into the middle of the room and was followed by the young girl whom he was soon to marry. Her cheeks grew rosy as everyone looked at her. She was a pretty girl, and her long, fair braids reached below her waist. And now the fiddler started up again with a lively tune. Who could keep still now? Surely Gustav could not. He took hold of one of Frigga's hands, and away they spun around the room. But it was not a simple waltz, such as you have seen. The girl held her other hand above her head and showed her grace as she kept moving around Gustav. She kept perfect time and step as she did so. Other dances followed the spring dance. Ole's and Mary's eyes were wide with delight as they watched their older friends. Whenever one of the dances came to an end, there was a general shaking of hands in which the children joined with a right good will. The time to go home came all too soon, but it was near the middle of summer. It was not dark even at ten o'clock in the evening. Good nag, good nag, cried everyone, after they had drunk again to the health of the baby and his proud parents and the hands of all had been heartily shaken once more. End of chapter 3